Muhammad al Mustafa wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi wa qtafa atharahu ila yawmiddin rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amni wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli All praises are due to Allah I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except the Almighty Allah I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's last and final messenger May all the peace, blessings of the Almighty be upon his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In this night of Jumu'ah, we ask Allah to bless us, to bless upon us, to bless whatever we say, and to guide us to the straight path. Amin ya. I ask Allah to grant shifa to those who are sick, and to their loved ones. May Allah look after those who look after them. May Allah reward them the best in dunya and akhirah. Amen. Any question before we start? One question or two? Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I wanted to ask about um, Salah uh, Sunnah uh, Subuh. It says that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that um, two, two rakaats of the prayer is better than the world and everything in it. And it's more beloved to him than everything in the world. What does that mean, Sheikh? Thank you. Thank you. There is one sunnah that people have forgotten, which is the two rakaats before Salat al-Fajr. Two rakaats before Fajr and then Sunnah of Fajr, and then Subuh. Those two rak'ahs better than the whole dunya and all what it contains. Two rak'ahs, then you pray the Fajr, Sunnah, then you pray the Subuh. Many people forget those two rak'ahs. They were so dear to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are after Adhan. After Adhan of Subh, you pray two rak'ahs, then you pray Sunnah of Fajr, then you, you pray your Subh in this order. Yes. Oh, two, two, two. Yes. Oh, I thought two, two. So there's an extra two. Yeah, that's what most people do. They focus only on the Sunnah Mu'akkada. Uh, and then they do Fardu. There, there are two rak'ahs before Sunnah Mu'akkada. They are highly recommended. So, Shay, uh, all, all is after the uh, Azan. All the two after the Azan. Before Azan is Tahajjud. Yes. Anything you pray before Azan al Subuh is Tahajjud. Alhamdulillah. Congratulations. After the Azan, as salatu Khairun Min Al you pray these two rak'ahs. Then you pray Sunnah of Fajr, which is Sunnah Mu'akkada. Then you pray Subah. Why is it so special? Is it more special than Subah itself? We don't know. There is no answer for Ibadat. For Ibadat, for Ibadat Allah wants, you, wants to, to see only submission. It, Allah wants only submission because he's God. We need to trust him. Now, the Prophet ﷺ taught us that this is more beloved to uh, Allah and his messenger than anything else. We don't know why. Yes. So when you want to do it, what do you say? What is your niyat? Turaqah, sunnah lillahi ta'ala. And then the second one? So, that is sunnah mu'akkada. That is sunnah al-fajr. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then fardu. Yeah. Good. What else? Uh, Shay, on the prayers, the, the last prayers we should pray is uh, su uh, Witir, right? Sunnah Witir. The last prayer of the day, yes. Yes. So, okay. Uh, so, normally, so it's after Tahajjud that we pray Witir. No. The, the best way is to sleep, to go to bed while praying Witir. That's the best. 
So you end your day with Witr and go to bed. Because you may not wake up for Tahajjud. You may wake up for Salat Fajr, but not for Tahajjud. So safer to always pray uh, Witr. If you think you are strong and you are used to get up, then in this case, you can delay the Witr. Sheikh, if I pray Witr, now, now, after Isha, I pray Witr. And then go to sleep. And then I get up for Tahajjud. Can I do Tahajjud? Yes, you can. But don't repeat the Witr. It's okay. You can do Tahajjud. Then wait for Adhan. Then pray what I explained. Two, two, two. And then you are done, mashallah. The other way, you pray Isha and you go sleep. You pray Isha, then you go sleep. It's okay. You pray Isha, then you go sleep. And then you get up for Tahajjud. You pray a few rak'as, then you pray with her before Adhan. It's optional. The Prophet Sallallahu did both. The Prophet Sallallahu did both. Good. What else? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Now there's a conflict here. I have grown up thinking, and I always heard from ulamas that the 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 two rakat of sunnah fajr is referred to the sunnah fajr, which is just before the fardu prayers, and um, it is very important to have these two rakat. So I'm first time hearing from you. Yes, there are two before that two. So this is my first time, you know? So Yeah, I know. Uh, so I don't know whether it's mazhab or... That's, or, why, that's why you have Sheikh Zubair. Because yeah, <laughs> if you know everything, then you don't need the uh, Sheikh. Yeah, this I is know. why we learn. I also didn't know about it mm. until a few years ago. And say, Allah increase me in knowledge. Now, we are all aware that most people do two rak'as and then fajr, subuh. But there is this secret that only few people know, which is the two rak'as before, then you do the, mashallah, the sunnah of fajr, then you do subuh. If there is time, if you go to the masjid and there is time, now uh, these imams are super fast. Five minutes, they do iqama. What is this? 10 minutes maximum. By the time you reach, they're already praying. Yeah. Because salat is supposed to be in the masjid for men. Let's say now you are praying in your house. Okay, what stops you from doing two and then two? And then you lead your wife and children. Yeah. Now, this is sunnah of the Prophet. It has nothing to do with madhab. You want to do it, do it. You don't want it, it's up to you. It's optional. It's not wajib. It's not wajib. It's just afdal. It is afdal to do so. Good. What else? Uh, Shay, is there any sunnah uh, prayers before asar and after asar? No. Uh, and there are only tahiyyat al-masjid. If you go to the masjid, you pray tahiyyat masjid before asr. Then you pray asr and there is no sunnah after asr. Okay, so in total, yeah. Okay, so in total, there's 12 uh, sunnah prayers, right? Uh, no, the... no, 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 no. That is the 12 rak'ahs uh, rawatib. Rawatib means the Prophet وسلم, used to do them frequently. Two rak'ahs before Fajr, four rak'ahs before Dhuhr, two rak'ahs after Dhuhr, so two and six, already eight, two rak'ahs after Maghrib, and two rak'ahs after Isha. Twelve. I repeat them. Two rak'ahs before Fajr, which I'm talking about, two rak'ahs, uh, four rak'ahs before Dhuhr, two rak'ahs after Dhuhr, 
no rak'as before, no rak'as after asr. Two rak'as after maghrib, two rak'as after isha. If you do this every day, Allah will build for you a palace in paradise. That's the price that is waiting for you. Inshallah. Got it? Thank you, Shay. Yeah, thank you, Shay. Okay, let's start now. Bismillah. Last week before the blackout, may Allah bless all of us for being in class, yet there was a blackout. We had a target to finish, alhamdulillah, talking about hellfire, but Allah wanted us to postpone it until today, inshallah ta'ala. So we were talking about the condition of people in hellfire. Some na'udhu billah will have their intestines spilled out of their stomachs. And they be, so we see na'udhu billah, people see their stomachs, uh, spleen, livers, kidneys, intestines, all outside. Moreover, they turn around them like a donkey turns around a treadmill, okay? Because of what they used to do in dunya. And usually this person is the one who used to tell people to do good and he doesn't do it. And used to forbid people from haram and evil and he does it. Hypocrites. Today, tonight, we talk about other punishment of people of Jahannam, the chains and the hammers. There are chains, fetters, and hammers in Jahannam. May Allah save me and you from all kinds of torture in dunya and akhir. Let's start with, uh, I welcome the new students. All of you are welcome anyways especially the new students. So let's start with Sister Zurina. Number 10, the chains, fetters, and hammers of the people of hell. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The chains, fetters, and hammers of the people of hell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that the people of hell will have chains, fetters, and hammers in the fire. For the rejecters, we have prepared iron chains, yokes and a blazing fire. With us are fetters to bind them, and a fire to burn them, and a foot that chokes and a penalty grievous. grievous. The yokes will be placed around their necks. We shall put yokes on the, right, on the necks of the unbelievers. It will only be a requital for their ill or evil deeds. When yokes shall be round their necks and the chains, they shall be dragged along. The chains or fetters are something with which Allah SWT will punish them. With, with us are fetters. The chains are another kind of punishment with which the wrongdoers will be tied up, just as criminals are chained, chained in this world. See how the Quran describes them. The have, you seen, have you seen criminals when they are taken to jail? Na'udhu Billah. There will be chains around them and there will be fetters on their neck, on their hands, on their feet. That is very disgracing. In dunya. Yawm al qiyamah. Do you know how big is the chain? You think the chains of today? In one hadith, one part of the chain is as big as the mountain of Uhud. Some people may not believe. They say, how come? The human will be as big as the mountain of Uhud. His tooth. Imagine with me, if I bring a chain now, chain. Like this. Hold, 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 hold. You right? Right? Now, when we take one, it's as big as the mountain of Uhud. You may say, how come? You think the human will be just in this size? We said that the tooth of one of them will be like the mountain of Uhud. Allahu Akbar. Yes. They be tied up to their necks, to their feet. Bring them to hellfire. Bring them to hellfire. 
They denied. They ate the food of Allah and worshipped another God. They drank the water of Allah that Allah created for them. And they have worshipped another God. They have used the money that Allah gave them, the houses that Allah gave them, the children that Allah gave them. Huh? They use the eyes against Allah. They use the ears against Allah. So they pay back. Fair and square. Fair and square. So please understand. The first thing we need to understand, there will be chains, there will be fetters. We didn't talk about the hammers yet. So Allah mentioned in Surah 76, 73, Surah 40, for the rejecters of the faith, we have prepared iron chains, yokes, and blazing fire. So the yokes, the chains are mentioned. What is mentioned also, as Sister read for us, is the fetters. Fetters. How about the hammers? We will see. Continue, sister. Continue. Okay. The chains are another kind of punishment with which the wrongdoers will be tied up. Just mm. as criminals are chained in this world. See how the Quran describes them. The stern command will say, seize him and bind him and burn him in the blazing fire. Further, make him march in a chain whereof the length is 70 cubits. Allah. Now, now, sisters and brothers, chain, the chain, how, how long? Zeruha, the length of it, 70 cubits. Now, imagine, imagine with me, the chain of one man in hand. Allahu Akbar. 70 cubits, that's the length of it. 35 meters, cubit is this. 50 centimeters. 35 meters. Yes, and you see, you think how, how heavy it is? May Allah save us. Continue, please. Allah SWT has promised the people of hell cook rocks of iron which are like hammers. The evildoers will be beaten with when they try to escape from the fire, and they will be thrown even deeper into hell. And for them are hook rocks of iron to punish them. Every time they seek to get away therefrom, from anguish, they will be driven back therein. And it will be said to them, taste the torment of burning. May Allah save us. Khalas, there are ayahs, there are many ahadith proving there will be chains, fetters, yokes, and hammers. May Allah save us. Ya Rabb, save us. Alhamdulillah. Number 11. Number 11. They will be accompanied by the objects of worship and their devils in hell. The we talked about this yesterday. Yesterday. Last night. We talked about uh, they will fight. They will quarrel. quarrel. This is in... In uh, Yawm al Qiyamah, they will quarrel with one another. They will dispute. I hope you were not being sung when I was talking, huh? like some people here. Takbir. Yeah? Okay. Uh, and laughing. Allahu Allah. Akbar. Yes. Allahu Akbar. Yeah, Sheikh Zuber explaining. And some people closing their eyes. Alish, alhamdulillah, I'm doing my, my jihad. So, <clears throat> there will be people fighting with each other. Now in hell, they go in hell. Before hell, they will fight. Yom al Qiyamah. You told us, you misled us. Then you, na'udhu billah, a person will look at his shaitan and he said, You see, I followed you. He said, I just told you, uh, don't blame me. Blame yourself. Somebody talking to his limbs. Oh, my hand, why did you hit Anayatim? Why did you steal money? 
Why did you touch something that didn't belong to you? The hand said, you told me. You told me do that. All right, we have seen that yesterday. Now inside hell, let's see. They will be accompanied by the objects of worship and their devils in hell. The disbelievers, Kufar, and the polities, Mushrikin, used to glorify the false deities and ah. they worship instead of Allah. They would defend them and would spend money and sacrifice their lives for them and their way. On the day of resurrection, Allah will cause those deities that they used to worship instead of him to enter the fire as a source of humiliation and shame for them so that they will know that they were misled and that they worship something that had no power either to benefit them or to harm them. Verily, you disbelievers and the false gods that you worship besides Allah are but fuel for hell. To it will you surely come. If this had been gods, they would have, they would not have got there. But each one will abide therein. Ibn Rajab says, because the Kufar worship their gods instead of Allah and believe that they will intercede for them with Allah and will bring them closer to him, they will be punished by having these gods in hell with them as a source of humiliation and shame and to make them feel deep sorrow and regret. Because when a punishment is accompanied by the thing that was the reason for the punishment, the pain and sorrow becomes more intense. For this reason, the sun and the moon will be thrown into hell and will be fueled for it to punish those wrongdoers who used to worship them instead of Allah, the Almighty, as the Hadith says. The sun and the moon will be rolled up in hell. Kurtubi says, they will be placed in hell because they were worshipped instead of Allah. It is not a punishment for them because they are inanimate, but that will be done in order to increase the sorrow and shame of the kafirin, the disbelievers. Allah this Allah. is what some of the scholars say. Said, for the same reason, the kufar and their devils will be gathered together so as to make the punishment more intense. And if anyone withdraws himself from the remembrance of Allah, the all gracious be appoint for him an evil, one to be an intimate companion to him. Such evil once really hindered them from the path, mm. but they think they are being guided aright. At length, when such a one comes to us, he says to his evil companion, Would that between me, would that between me and you were the distance of east and west? Ah. Evil is the companion indeed. When you have done wrong, it will avail you nothing that day that you shall be partners in punishment. Allahu Akbar. Even the sun and the moon will be thrown in her fire. Not because they have sinned, because they have been worshipped. But Sheikh, Jesus also was worshipped. Is Allah going to throw him in hell? No. Isa alayhi salam, his mother Maryam, anyone who has been worshipped will not go to hell if he has never told people not to worship him. Because he or she is inanimate. I mean, animate. They are creation of Allah. That has reason. The sun and the moon don't feel. They don't feel. They don't have feelings like you and me. But Allah will put them because they were two big creation of Allah that has been worshipped, especially by the group called Sabi'ah, Sapiens. Sapiens worship the sun and the moon. Okay? Especially in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Up to today, there are still worshippers of the sun and the moon. Uh, and I was shocked when I went to the US. Uh, I gave a lecture and the lecture was about astronomy in Islam. And do you know, I never thought that there would be, I mean, it was really big. I, I don't know from where people came. For a while, I thought I was very famous. These people really admired science 
And then I realized, oh, some of them worship the sun and the moon. So they wanted to see what does Islam say about them. It was a wonderful lecture, alhamdulillah, University of Houston. I'm telling you, thousands, thousands of people attended, non-Muslims, interested in learning about sun and the moon and astronomy and astrology and this and that. Alhamdulillah, I did my best for da'wah. Show them what the Quran says about the sun, the moon, all the ayahs, what the Quran says about other stars, what the Quran says. And many of them promised they will study the Quran and find for themselves. The point I'm making, I realized that some of them worship the sun and the moon in America. Oh, that's why they came. It wasn't for Sheikh Zubair. It was for, oh, they wanted to see, which Alhamdulillah, I used the logic of Sayyidina Ibrahim السلام, telling them, this is my God, about the sun, about the moon, about the stars, to prove to them they are not gods because they keep coming and going and they are just creation of Allah. So the sun and the moon will be put in hell, but because they don't feel like humans, so it's not punishment for them. But to increase the punishment of those who worship the sun and the moon. You think the sun and the moon were gods? Come see. They are already in hell with you. And that, that will add to the pain and the sorrow of those who worship the sun and the moon. Same thing for those who worship the cross. Those who worship the statues. The statues will be thrown with them in hellfire. Look at your God. He's burning with you. Your God that you worshipped all your life is burning with you. We told you he's not God. Our prophets came and told you Allah cannot be seen with the naked eye in dunya. Allah is the one who created heavens and earth. Allah is the one who is in control. Allah is the one who brings the night and the day. Allah is the one who gives birth, uh, give, give um, uh, life to the, the dead. Allah is the one who brings the dead out of the living and the living out of the dead. We gave you many evidences, but you did not want to listen. You were arrogant and you rejected the faith. Okay? Thank you, Sister Zorina. May Allah bless you. Yes, Allah. Allah. So, Shaytan will be the Qareen of those who stay away from the guidance of Ar Rahman. And, sisters and brothers, the closer you are to Allah, the weaker your Shaytan is. Your Qareen, your Shaytan, becomes very weak. Like Alhamdulillah, our Qareens are being punched every day. Every day you follow me in class, day and night you are just knocking them down. They are very weak, pale. Now they are all together saying, man, they are killing us, these people. They are attending class again. They don't get tired. While those who stay away from the remembrance of Allah, their Qareen and Shaitan is strong. They are in the malls now and watching movies and eating outside and having fun, dating, karaoke. So if you stay closer to the remembrance of Allah, to the Quran, to the Hadith, to classes like this, your Shaitan becomes weak. So you are in control of him. You tell him, get up, let's go to pray. He has to follow. But when you stay away from the dhikr of Ar-Rahman, especially the Quran, what happens? Your shaitan becomes strong. Your tarim becomes strong. Is this clear? That's the ayah, the last ayah, sister, read for us from Surah 43. All right. Let's see another sister. How about sister Shariza? Bismillah. Number 12. Number 12. Assalamu alaikum, Jane. Wa alaikum, sarah, their sorrow, regret, and supplications. When the disbelievers kufar see hell, they will be filled with intense regret at a time when regret will be of no avail. And they would feel in their hearts regret when they see the torment, and they will be judged with justice and no wrong will be done unto them. When the, when the kafir will look at the record of his deeds and sees his kufar and shirk, for which he deserves eternal hell, he will pray for oblivion and death. But he, but he who is given his record behind his back, soon will he cry for perdition and he will enter a blazing fire. 
they will repeat their prayer for oblivion when they are thrown into the fire and its heat touches them. And when they are cast, bound together into a constricted place therein, they will be plead for destruction here, there and then. This day plead not for a single destruction, plead for destruction oft repeated. Their screams will grow louder and more desperate and they will call on their Lord hoping that he will take them out of the fire. Therein, will they, therein they will cry aloud for assistance. Our Lord, bring us out. We shall work righteousness, not the deeds we used to do. At that time, they will come to realize the error and foolishness of their kufr. They will further say, had we but listened or used our intelligence, we would not now be among the companions or dwellers of the blazing fire. They will, they will then confess their sins, but far will be forgiveness from the companions of the blazing fire. They will say, our Lord, twice have you made us without life and twice have you given us life. Now have we recognized our sins? Is there any way out of this? But their prayer will be turned down. They will be answered as animals deserve to be answered. They will say, our Lord, our misfortune overwhelmed us and we became a people astray. Our Lord, bring us out of this. If ever we return to evil, then shall we be wrongdoers indeed. He, Allah, will say, be driven into it with ignominy and speak not to me. The promise will come true and they will reach a destination where no prayer will benefit them and there will be no hope. If only you could see when the guilty ones will bend low their heads before their Lord saying, Our Lord, we have seen and we have heard. Now then send us back to the world. We will work righteousness for we do indeed now believe. If we had so willed, surely we could certainly have brought every soul its true guidance. But the word from me will come true. I will fill hell with jinns and men altogether. Taste you then, for you forgot the meeting of this day of yours. And we too will forget you. Taste the penalty of eternity for your evil deeds. After that, the people of fire will call upon the keepers of the fire, asking them to intercede so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might reduce the torment for them. Those in the fire will say to the keepers of hell, pray to your Lord to lighten us the penalty for a day at least. They will say, did there not come to you your messengers with clear signs? They will say yes. They will reply, then pray as you like. But the prayer of those without faith is nothing but futile wandering in mazes of error. They then will ask for intercession so that their Lord might annihilate them. And they will cry, O Malik, God of hell, would that your Lord put an end to us? He will say, nay, but you shall abide. Everything Very we good. ask... Hold on, Sister Sharif. See, now they are begging. When they enter Jahannam, they start begging and making dua. Why you didn't make dua before? When Allah asks you, when you were in this dunya, like now, you and me, why we don't make dua now in our sujood, after our salat, between uh, Adhan and Iqama, during fear, when we are sick, when we are traveling, when there is rain. Huh? These are good times. Now, when you saw Jahannam, you are begging. Well, there are other worshippers of Allah who used to beg him when life was good. Now, because you see Jahannam, you are begging. Allah says no. And he will refuse to listen to them because he told them, you did not obey me, Allahu Akbar. You went against my will. You didn't give me my rights. The right of Allah is to be worshipped alone, without any partner, without any shirk. I didn't give him that right. And now they are begging, oh Allah, give us another chance. Please, 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 please. There is no please. Please understand that. Understand that, sisters and brothers. We have only one chance. We need to make it right with Allah's mercy. And Allah has been already merciful to us. The fact that you and I found ourselves Muslims, there is no greater ni'mah than this. There is no greater ni'mah than Allah making you and me Muslims. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, thank Allah. You and I could have been that non-Muslim neighbor that you know. Na'udhu billah, yeah. 
Imagine that, sisters and brothers. I know you have some neighbors. Yani, they could be good, but not enough. Not enough. Must obey and worship Allah. Continue, please. Everything they asked for will be turned down. There will be no coming out of the fire, no reduction in the torment, and no oblivion. Rather, it is an ongoing eternal punishment, and at that time they will be told. And whether you are patient of it or impatient of it, it is all the same. You are only being requited for what you used to do. Then their wailing will increase, and they will keep and they will weep for a long time. Let them laugh a little, much will they weep, a recompense for the evil that they do. They will weep until no tears are left, then they will weep blood and their te tears will leave traces on their faces like the heavy rain and flood leave traces in the rock. al Mustadrak by Al-Hakim, there is a report from Abdullah ibn Qais that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the people of hell will weep so much that if ships were placed in their tears, they would float. They will mm. weep blood, meaning instead of tears. And as Ibn Malik reported that the Prophet wasallam said, the people of hell will be made to weep and they will weep until they have no tears left. Mm. Then they will weep blood until they have it as, and they will have as if it were channels in their faces. If ships were put in them, they would float. Those evildoers lost their own souls and their families when they preferred kufr to iman. Listen to the wailing and cries when they are punished. The day when their faces will be turned upside down in the fire, they will say, woe to us. Would that we had obeyed Allah and obeyed the messenger, and they would say, our Lord, verily we obeyed our chiefs and our great ones, and they misled us from the right path. Our Lord, give them double penalty and curse them with a very great curse. Allahu Akbar. Listen. Allahu Akbar. So, like we said yesterday, the people of Jahannam will curse their leaders. And the leaders said, well, what's you? We told you and you followed. This is why you should not follow blindly. Sisters and brothers, don't follow blindly. Allah also gave you aql. Intelligence, use it. Somebody tell you jump to the fire, you jump to the fire. One day the Prophet ﷺ told Sahaba, few Sahaba, I appoint so and so on you as your leader. Obey him, listen to his commands, and obey. He's your leader during this. Uh, it was Syria, military expedition. So that, that leader at night, around the bonfire, he told those Sahaba, what did Rasulullah Sallallahu say to you about me? To obey me, right? They said, yes. He said, jump into the fire. We jump into the fire? He said, yes. All of you jump in, inside this fire. They were about to do it. Finally, they didn't do it. When they went back to Medina, they said to Rasulullah what happened? You know what he told them? The Prophet said, if you jumped into the fire, you would have never left it. If you obey the leader because he told you to kill yourselves, you would have gone to hellfire forever. Obey in what is right. Obey in what is good, not in what is evil. That's what the Prophet ﷺ meant. If he tells you fight, fight. If he tells you go sleep, sleep. If he tells you we rest in this area, not in another area, listen to the leader. If he says time to pray, then time to pray. If he says two of you be guards, the others go sleep, obey, but not. If he orders you to drink alcohol, you obey him. If he asks you to jump into the fire, you commit suicide. That's what Allah wants us. So our leaders will not help us if they tell you to do something wrong. I'm talking about our political leaders. So you obey them only if whatever they say is according to the Quran and Sunnah. Sheikh, how do I know that? Through knowledge. That's why you need to learn. 
so that no one takes advantage of your ignorance. You know that. Shaitan, shaitan has power over who? Ignorant people. Ignorant people. He has access to them. Even when their intention is very good, shaitan can deceive you. Devil's deception. But he cannot deceive the ulama or the people who are students of knowledge. Not easy for him. Alas? Very good. Continue, please. Listen to, listen to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the condition. We seek refuge with Allah from that. As for those who are wretched, they will be in the fire, sighing in a high and low tone. They will dwell therein for all the time that the heavens and earth endure, except as your Lord wills. As the judge said, the high tone as Zafir is because of the intensity of the groaning, and it is very high. It is also suggested that as Zafir means the panting of the breath in the chest due to extreme fear, so that the ribs become swollen. The low tone, Ashahik, is a long drawn out breath or an intake of breath. In either case, it is an indication of the great extent of their grief and anguish. The situation is likened to that of those whose heart is overwhelmed by heat and whose soul is surrounded by it. A life said, as Zafir means that a man will take deep breaths because of his intense grief, and Ashahik refers to his exhaling. Very good. Is there a diamond or something called Zafir? As if I have heard or seen something like that. Zafir? No? Zafir is not a good name, huh? Don't name your son Zafir. Zafir. I'm not saying Zafir, Zafir. No, Zafir is good, but not Zafir. Zafir is, look, is, you know when you breathe, when you make a deep breath, when you take a deep breath, when you let go, it's called Shahiq. Jahannam has a Zafir and has Shahiq. May Allah save us. She roars like a, somebody having difficulty to breathe because she's angry. She's full of anger. She is the punishment of Allah. She is the anger of Allah. Yes, my sisters and brothers. That's what the, uh, the people of hellfire will go. Two types. The kuffar and the hypocrites. The hypocrites among the Muslims. And on those who rejected Allah's Tawheed and Rasulullah Sallallahu after he came. After the Prophet came, whoever does not follow him is going to hell. The last Prophet of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is their condition in hellfire. Now, how to save ourselves from Jahannam? Very good question. What are the things if we do, inshaAllah Ta'ala, we will not go to hell. May Allah reward anyone who has been nice to us. Amin. <clears throat> Bismillah. Ready? How to save ourselves? How to avoid Jahannam? Yalla ha. How about Sister Naziha? Do you have the book, Sister Naziha? Yes, Sheikh, I do. Hang on. I was just typing my questions to you, but okay. MashaAllah. We are right. in page 147. Yes, sir. Uh, how to save oneself from the fire. As it is kufur that will condemn a person to eternal hell, the way to be safe from hell is through iman and righteous deeds. So the Muslims pray to their Lord with faith, with faith to save them from the fire. Those who say, our Lord, we have indeed believed, forgive us then our sins and save us from the agony of the fire. And then the next ayah, our Lord, not for naught have you created all this glory to you. Give us salvation from the torment of the fire. Our Lord, any whom you admit to the fire, truly you cover with shame and never will wrongdoers find any helpers. Our Lord, we have heard the call of one 
calling us to faith. Believe in your Lord, and we have believed. Our Lord, forgive us our sin and blot out from us our iniquities and take to yourself our souls in the company of the righteous. Our Lord, grant us what you did promise unto us through your messengers and save us from the shame of the day of judgment, for you never break your promise. Many hadith speak in detail about this matter and describe the deeds that will protect one from the fire. For example, love of Allah. In Al-Hakim's Al-Mustadrak and Ahmad Al-Musnad, a report from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anh, said, the messengers of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, by Allah, Allah will never throw one who loves him and whom he loves into the fire. Fasting is- Hold on, very good. So the first thing is what? Iman and Iman with faith. What takes people to hell? Kufr. What takes people to paradise? Iman. This is why we become mu'min. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Wallahi, very easy to go to paradise. Guys, it's very easy to go to paradise. I give you an example. How much money you pay when you go to the masjid? When you go to pray? Zero. Do they charge you? Even parking is free. So far, huh? yeah, very soon, even the masjid, three ringgit, touch and go. My RFID, what is this? In KL, any turn you take, there is two ringgit. What is this? Long live Algeria. From east to west, you don't pay a penny. Drive, so far, even Algeria is going, is learning from Malaysia. Anyways, the first way to avoid hellfire is to become a Muslim, to embrace Islam. You and me, the Muslims, increase the Iman, love Allah. Because Allah promised anyone who loves him will not go to hell. Do we love Allah? The question. And if we do, how much? Do we love Allah more than we love ourselves? I don't think so. Do we love Allah more than we love our children? May Allah increase his love in our hearts, which is another ni'mah. Big ni'mah. If Allah makes you fond of him, you love him, your life rotates around what he says. You are so scared to upset him. And you are so happy when you do something good because you know he's happy. Okay, so the first thing is Iman. The second thing is fasting. Let's see. Number two. Fasting is also a source of protection from the fire. As Ahmad report in Al-Musnad and Al-Bahaki in Shu'ab Al-Iman with a Hassan Isnad from Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah the Exalted says, Fasting is a shield with which one may protect oneself from the fire. In Shu'ab yeah. al-Iman, al-Bayhaqi reports from Uthman ibn Abi al-As that Prophet wasallam said, fasting is a shield from the punishment of Allah. It is reported by Ahmad Nasai ibn Majah and ibn Khuzaimah and is Isnad and Sahih. If fasting is accomplished at the time of jihad against the enemy, then that is a great victory as it is reported from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever fasts one day when he is engaged in jihad for the sake of Allah, Allah will remove him, let his face 70 years distance from the fire. Ahmad Bukhari, Muslim Tirmidhi and Nasa'i. Other means of salvation from the fire are fear of Allah and jihad for his sake. Very good. But Before we go to the fear of Allah and jihad, how about fasting? as Jannah, the Prophet ﷺ said, Siyam is shield. Min mimada from Jahannam. It's like you are wearing, did you see the bomba? They have the firefighters. They have a special attire because they did with fire. You think just come and fight fire. Fire of the dunya, we cannot put it off. 
na'udhu billah. Let alone. So they have to wear special gears in case the fire touch them, it doesn't burn them. Fa that's your fasting. Each time you fast, you are getting away from hell. You are too close to hell. One day, 70 years. 70 years, you were too close to hell. One day, especially during the jihad. You fast while there is jihad. Allahu Akbar. You're going to jihad and fasting. And if you die, you die shaheed and fasting. Allahu Akbar. Who is like you? So that's the second. So iman, become a mu'min, you are far from hell. While you are mu'min, start fasting. This, this is why Allah wants to give us the reward of Ramadan. Ramadan is a big month, brothers and sisters. Very soon, inshallah, two more months. Rajab Sha'ban. Rajab is coming. Very soon. Yeah? Inshallah. So get ready. Start talking about Ramadan since we are talking about fasting. There are other means of saving yourself from hellfire. It is fear of Allah, taqwa. And the second one, jihad. Taqwa and jihad. Let's see. Continue. Please. Other means of salvation from the fire are fear of Allah and jihad for his sake. But for him who fears the standing before his Lord, there will be two garden, i.e. paradise. In, in paradise. Tirmidhi and Nasa'i report from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no one who weeps out of fear of Allah will enter hell until the milk goes back into the breast, i.e. never. And a man who never have both dust from fighting in a way of Allah and the smoke of hell. Bukhari reports from Abu Abbas that the messenger of Allah radiallahu anhu said, uh, sorry, messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no two feet that gets dusty for the sake of Allah will ever be touched by the fire. Muslim report from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "A kafir and the one who kills him will never meet in the fire of hell. We may also be shielded from the fire by seeking protection with Allah subhanahu wa taala from it." Very good. Those Stop there before we go in. So, a taqwa, stay away from sins. The other reason, the other thing that will, inshallah, take us away from hell is al-jihad. The Mujahideen are great people, sisters and brothers. What's wrong with Muslims? Anyone who is now fighting injustice, we call him terrorist. We are afraid of the kuffar, and they are the biggest terrorists of the world. You want to see who's terrorist? George Bush and Tony Blair. I said Blair, I know what I'm talking about. Blair. He's a liar, Blair. They are still living. Nobody goes and arrest them. They killed more than a million and a half Iraqis. Where are the weapons of mass destruction? Look at Iraq now. Gone. Two liars got together. They said, let's bomb Iraq. What is this? And nobody's telling them. Because they don't meet the profile, because they have tie, they don't have beard, because they brainwashed you that a terrorist should look like this with a gun behind him. Alhamdulillah, we have books behind us. Otherwise, you see, they condition the mind while they are the biggest terrorists on earth. Ah, so jihad fi sabilillah, we are not ashamed. Jihad is to defend our religion, our property, our honor, our women, our brothers, our sisters. You don't come to our countries, we, we leave you alone. You don't harm us, we don't harm you. We are also, we want to live. We want to also eat banana, but not the necessary uh, gore, goreng banana. Like bear, we also want to live. We would like to have children. We like to have grandchildren. We want to own some properties. We want to travel the world and see the world. What do you think? The shoes that are dusty of a, of, of, of a mujahid are better than palaces of some. 
that shoe that is full of dust. Allah says that man will go to Jannah because he's standing for something that Allah loves so much. What did Rasulullah do, by the way? Wasn't he dusty? In jihad, what do you think the Prophet said? He was full of dust. They used to even remove his dust from his shoulders, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His shoes, his face. Is this clear? So do not let people put down the farida of jihad. Jihad is something very honorable in Islam. Continue, please. Those who say, our Lord, avert from us the wrath of hell, for, it is, for its wrath is indeed an affliction grievous. Evil indeed is, in, evil indeed is it as an abode and a place to rest in. Ahmad ibn Majah ibn Hiban and Al-Hakim report with a sahih is not from Anas that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no one asks Allah for paradise three times, but paradise will say, O oh Allah, admit him to paradise. And no Muslim man asks Allah for protection from hell three times, but hell will say, O oh Allah, save him from me. Bukhari and Muslim report from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was discussing the angels who seek out gatherings of zikir, he said, Allah asked them and he knows best. What are they seeking protection from? They tell him from the fire. He asked, and have they seen it? They say, no, by Allah, O Lord, they have not seen it. He says, how would it be if they had seen it? They say, they would be even more afraid and anxious to escape it. He says, bear witness that I have forgiven them. But I have Allahu Akbar. Another reason for, inshallah, us to avoid hellfire is to keep making dua. Rabbana sarif anna azaba jahannam inna azabaha kana gharama. إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرَّتْ وَمُقَامًا Oh Allah, please make us avoid the wrath of hellfire. For its wrath is indeed an affliction grievous. That's what a mu'min should say. You should seek refuge in Allah from Jahannam. And I have good news for you, alhamdulillah. What number is this? Seven. Yalla, count, count. Seven, seven. Alhamdulillah, seven. If seven times you say to Allah, oh Allah, save me from hellfire, hellfire will say to Allah, oh Allah, I don't want him. I don't want her. And if you ask Allah seven times per day, every day, Al-Jannah, Jannah says, oh Allah, give him to me, give her to me. Seven times make sure no day pass from your life except at least seven times you say to Allah, Oh Allah, save me from Jahannam. Jahannam will say, Ya Allah, I don't want him. I don't want her. And ask Allah, Ya Rab, grant me paradise. And paradise will say, Please, Ya Allah, give him to me, give her to me. Rasul Hadith Sahih. Whoever asks Allah to save him from Jahannam seven times per day, Allah will accept and Jahannam will, does, uh, doesn't want you, the Prophet said. And whoever asks Allah seven times, paradise, Allah will accept, and paradise say, Ya Rab, please give him to me. Can't we do this? From now on, teach yourselves and your loved ones. Allahumma inni as'aluka ridaka wal jannah. Wa Allah, I'm asking you your pleasure and jannah. Wa a'udhu bika min sakhatika wal nar. And I seek refuge in you from your Wrath and from Jahannam. Seven to Jukali, inshallah. Khalas? Shay, can yes. you also say that Allahumma ajirni min al nar? Yes, okay. Allahumma ajirna min al nar. Another dua, yes. Any dua, even in English, even in Malay, in Chinese, in any language. In any language. If you know Arabic, better. Yes. Okay. Very good. Shay. When you say yes. this, please protect me from hellfire. Please put me in, in um, uh, uh, paradise. paradise. 
Um, but you also have a mountains of dosa. You're still doing riba and those sort of things, you know, on the side. And then you're still cheating people, but you still say those things, all those do'as. Will you still be entered into uh, paradise? Ah, very good, very good. No, we're supposed to make tawbah. Because look, Allah may forgive you. Do people forgive you if you cheated someone? Here is the problem. Allah may forgive us for the wrongs we did against him. But that doesn't mean we are safe if we have wrong people. Oh, so I need to stop harming others. I have to give people their rights. If I offend my mom, if I pray 600 years, I should beg my mom's forgiveness. Huh. If a man wrongs his wife, if the wife wrongs her husband, the children don't listen to the parents, the parents neglect the children. Big problem. No, we have to stop. Yes, sister, you're right. We have to fear Allah. But beside that, we should beg Allah for saving us from hellfire. Beside all what we said, Iman, fasting, jihad, dua, we still have to beg Allah for forgiveness and from, for safety from hellfire. Mm. Thank you, Shay. You're welcome. Hi, from Shay. Can you explain this? Is it true there was this hadith that says that Shaitan will give a khutbah during Judgment Day, telling his followers as to why they should not have followed him. And I don't understand if that was the case, and if he already have seen the greatness of Allah, why is Shaitan still stubborn and arrogant? I, I really don't comprehend that he's giving a khutbah during Judgment Day, and yet he is still, you know, how he is. Very good. Uh... Because not everybody saw shaitan in his real form. Allah wants him to speak. Here is the shaitan you believed. This is the shaitan you followed. Then he talks to them. Surah, Surah Ibrahim is very clear. Surah 14. Shaitan will say, I did not force you. I just suggested to you. And you obeyed me. I didn't pull a gun or a sword, put it on your neck. I just told you, go commit zina, and you listen to me. I told you, go to the bank and borrow money with riba, and you, you listen to me. I just scared you about hijab in the West, and you removed it. But the nun doesn't remove it. What's wrong with you? A sikh will wear his turban. Sheikh Zubair cannot put something like this in London or Paris. So the Sikh has more faith than me. What's wrong with us? A Jew has longer beard than Sheikh Zubair. And he's wearing Jewish clothes. A Muslim is running away. What is this? Anyways, Shaitan will speak. Definitely. For Allah to show the kuffar that he's here it is. Don't think he doesn't exist. Here it is. Did you see him now? Burn together with him in hell. So he will let him speak. Now, why is shaitan still stubborn? Right? Up to now. Because he lost. He knows Allah will never change decision. Allah never changes decision. Once he makes a decision. He knows he's cursed. He knows very well Allah will not give him rahma. That's why he keeps doing what he has to do. He knows. He's quite efficient, by the way, shaitan. May Allah curse him. Look at me. In, in what sense he is efficient? He is focused. And he doesn't give up on you and me. If he cannot get us today, he, comes, he tries to, uh, tomorrow, next week. That he will keep. And he's focused. He doesn't waste time. He doesn't waste time because he wants to take as many people from the people of hell, uh, from, Bani, from the children of Adam 
with him to hellfire. So he knows he has no other thing to do except to keep, insist on sinning because he's not going to be forgiven. He was cursed. Because Allah, when he told him, why didn't you obey me and bow to Adam? He said, I am better than him. He was arrogant. If he said, forgive me, O Allah, I made a mistake. Things would have been different. Adam did. Allah asked Adam, why did you eat from the tree? I told you not to eat. What did Adam say? He didn't say, well, no, he bowed and said, forgive me, Allah. I, I accept my mistakes. I made mistakes. So Allah forgave him, but exiled him from the garden. Forgave him, but said, you cannot stay in this garden. Get out from the garden. Shaitan, Allah asked him why you didn't bow to Adam. Instead of saying, oh, my Lord, forgive me. I, I was wrong. He said, I am better than him. So then Allah cursed him. So he knows. He knows he has lost his appeal with Allah. Yeah, because he was arrogant. You cannot do that with Allah. Allah, you just tell him, sorry. Ma'af, ya Rab, forgive me. Don't justify. Even Yom al qiyamah when Allah asks you, why did you borrow money from the bank? Say, please forgive me, I was wrong. Don't say, well, I wanted to have a future for my children. What future? What future? And the children who take you to hell, you don't need them, huh? I'm telling you now. Some of you are very weak when it comes to your children. Your weakness is your kids. What do you do with the children who will take you to hell? You're going to rob a bank so that you feed them? Huh? You're going to disobey Allah so that your children become uh, proud of you? I love daddy, I love mommy. Do you understand, sisters and brothers? Some of you, their weakness is their children. No. Your kids, they came from you. You are the asal. Yes. Be strong. Be strong here in your mind. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, for, forgive, me, for, forgive me for saying this, Sheikh. Yes, but, brother. Uh, this, uh, this uh, about the shaitan influencing and um, being arrogant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, all these uh, things happen. That's it's supposed to happen, right? That's that's why we are here. We are we are dealing with uh, the what the right and the wrong. I mean, this thing supposed to transpire in order for this dunya to like this exist like this. Yes, correct. Mm. Yes, you are right. The things were meant like this. But did Allah want that? No. Allah, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yarda li ibadihi al-kufr. The Quran says, inna Allah la yarda li ibadihi al-kufr. Allah is not pleased with his slaves to commit kufr. Allah even told us, here is my paradise. Worship me so that I give it to you. But he gave us free will. That free will with shaitan, with this, will take some people to hellfire. Yeah, it was meant for the universe to be this way. But did Allah, is Allah pleased with us to commit kufr? No, he doesn't want us to commit kufr. If that's your question. But you are right in analyzing. Everything was, Allah knew. Look at me. Even when Allah created Adam, he knew he will eat from the tree. He knew that shaitan will be jealous of him. But he did not force the shaitan to be jealous or not jealous. Shaitan chose. So that's why Allah will put him in hell. He has free will. 
we the humans also have free will. If we do, if we do the wrong decision, we pay for it. We just ask Allah to save us and keep us closer to Him until He takes us. Amin, ya. Yeah, my brothers and sisters. And very soon, sure. one of us we go back to Allah. Sorry. Go ahead, brother. Ali. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Share just uh, just a question, Share. Um, sometimes um, you 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 forget things, Share, because most things when you forget, you think is uh, or my understanding is from Shaitan. For example, Share. Let's say you're fasting in the month of Ramadan and you wake up, you completely forget and then you eat and then, okay, now you can continue fasting or you overslept for Fajr and suddenly sunrise and, uh, and, and you miss the prayer. Do you see that as something from shaitan or maybe Allah just wants to, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, have, give you a rest or, or, or a respite or something? How, how do you see that? If you genuinely 100% forget. Oh, no, combination of things. Uh, even forgetfulness come from shaitan. Forgetfulness of uh, good deeds. It comes from shaitan. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that you forgot. That's why you ate Ramadan. There was some water in front of you. You took some water, you drank. And then somebody says, what are you doing? I say, what do you mean? We are fasting. Oh, Allahu Akbar. I drank a whole uh, uh, cup of water. It's okay. It's okay. Your fast is correct. Continue fasting. Sheikh, I drank a lot of water. It's okay. Continue fasting. But Allah brought that forgetfulness as rahmah, although it's caused by shaitan or by your nafs. Sometimes you don't, you don't get up for Salat. I shouldn't be like every week, every day. Every day there is something wrong with you. Once in a blue moon, when the moon is blue, you know, that's saying. You, you, you didn't wake up. You're a human being. You're a human being. It's not the end of the world. But what should you do? That day give a lot of sadaqah. Shaitan himself will wake you up for Salat Fajr the next day because he doesn't Takbir. like Salat. Takbir. Yes, he tell you, Arifin, get up, get up, brother. Get up, get up. I don't want you to give Salat today. That's what you do to Shaitan. When he gets you in one thing, make Tawbah and do two or three good things that day. Shaitan will leave you alone. Oh, I like that. Yes. Yes. You made me not get up for salat. Today I'm going to the graveyard. Visit someone in hospital for Allah's sake. I will go to hospital, just look for someone, give him a gift. Lillahi ta'ala. That person, I don't even know you. Lillahi ta'ala. Uh, buy gift to your wife that day. Takbir. All the sisters are saying takbir. Allah. Allah. Ah. Allah. <laughs> Allah. Yeah. Uh, Serious. I have a question. I give. have a question. Sorry. Oh, you saw yep. give, give, give. And then shaitan will leave you alone. He will wake you up for salat fajr. Yes, sister. I, I, I typed it in, but in case we get run over, um, we run over the um, time. Uh, why are some souls born into Muslim parents, Sorry? families, and, and some are too far? You why? Know, like, sorry, you, I don't yeah. understand. Why? What? I didn't hear. When, when we were born, you know, you and I and and people in this group, where our souls were put into Muslim families, you know, Muslim, mm -hmm. the wombs of mother who is a Muslim. Why are some put into into non-believers? It's because you know, like you and I, the rest of us here, we have a clear advantage, you know. Yes, um, I agree. I agree. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. Now, yes, of course. Alhamdulillah. You know, uh, you don't appreciate it until you, you, you actually learn these things and what yeah. uh, hell has in store for you, for instance. But you know, I don't understand why some people have everything. You know, I mean, all odds. Okay, are I will answer. It. I got it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Number one, every child is born Muslim. 
every child is born Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in al Hadith al Sahih, narrated by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitra. Every baby born is born on fitra of Islam. The Hadith continues, فَأَبَوَاهُ يُحَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ His parents, however, will make him a Jew or Christian or otherwise, but not a Muslim. So it is the parents, it's society, it's the family we yes, are in. I, I, I get you. However, you know, that's what I meant by um, what are the chances if I were to be born into a Hindu family, for instance, you yeah. know, or as yeah. I am right now, I'm born to a Muslim. I have no interest in looking at other religion, you know, until I'm, I'm you, you know, I'm saying I, I, there's a clear disadvantage of a, a baby, or be born a, a, a Muslim, uh, given to be raised by non-Muslim. What are the chances of them reverting? Very good. Okay, here it is. Here, coming, coming. Now, is it Allah's fault for people to disbelieve in Him? Or is it their fault? Why those born in non-Muslim families don't become Muslim? What is stopping them? And why many Muslims who are born in Muslim families still go to hell? You see? So being born in a Muslim family definitely is an advantage, but it's not a guarantee to go to paradise. Likewise, being born to a non-Muslim family doesn't mean a guarantee you are going to hell. But there is an advantage of being born into a family. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah for that. But may, I know many, many Muslim families, na'udhu billah, they don't practice Islam. Although Allah gave them the advantage. And I know many, many non-Muslims who came to Islam. Families and individuals. So again, again, it is a choice we make, even with if we are born in a Muslim family or not born in a Muslim family. It's a choice we make. The question, why those people who are born in a non-Muslim family can excel in business, can become doctors, can become engineers, but they don't want to become Muslim? They are born into poor non-Muslim family. They still face poverty. They face hunger. They face sickness. They face disbelief and they succeed in dunya. Why they don't want to become Muslim? Likewise, the rich non-Muslims. See, although, alhamdulillah, they have access to knowledge now. There are many reasons for that. Hidayah comes from God. Another thing, Allah knows who is going to paradise and who is not. Still, he sends us prophets, he guides us, and he wants us to change. But Allah knows before he even he created heavens and earth, who will be Muslim, who will not. Who will go to paradise, who will not. He knows already. His knowledge is before even his creation. Sure, so I'm sure. Within, within that hold on, hold on. I want I want the sister if she if she understood, let her because it's good that she is thinking. What is it, I, sister? I understand from a Muslim perspective that the example you gave, some Muslim, some people, some babies born in into Muslim families may not necessarily grow up and practice Islam, mm. that I get. Um, I understand that because I'm, you know, um, I, can, I can appreciate that. But if you look at, um, at babies born um, as Muslims in, in Fitra, and you know, babies don't develop until, I don't know, eight, nine, 10, 11, whatever. And, and these are the formative years. And if you place them in a, um, in, in a 
kufar environment, you know, you, you open the eyes and the first thing you put in the mouth is pork, for instance. You know, you don't know any better until you're much older, but you're already disadvantaged in, in your formative years. Are, are you, do you, do you know what? It's just a question in my head, just wondering, although I'm, you know, when I think about it, I'm ever so grateful that I was born, I am, I was born a Muslim, you know, but, but like, it got me thinking, those people are really Yeah, but, but okay, I got you. Look at the Rahmah of Allah. Now look at the Rahmah of Allah. One minute before you die, you say Shahada, you go to paradise. How about that? Why they don't say it? You may live all your life non-Muslim. But Allah gives you a chance, say shahada and you die. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasul. You say it sincerely from your heart you end up in paradise. Where do you find an advantage like this? Yeah, we, we get that because we know that we learn that we are and we have been guided to learn these things you and I and and the yeah. rest in this group I take it as an example. Yes. But if you see if if you have been born into uh, and in your early years if you've already you know sailed away from the truth to come back to to the truth to even to get to this level of understanding that all you got to do is say shahada da, 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 all, all the rest of things that we're learning now for instance yeah for them who have who have been drifted way out there you know, the chances of them coming back is so, so slim, I think. No, you know? no, no. Here it is. As long as they come back to Allah, Allah will forgive all what they have done. Isn't that great? That is so true. It, that is true. We, we know that. We, we know that. Yes, and that's what we should tell them, sister. That's what we should tell them. When we meet them, say, come, don't worry about your past. Say shahada. Believe in it. Allah will forgive you. This is what we should focus. The end, how we end our life. It's not how we live our life. Even as Muslims, we have to be careful. We may live good life as Muslims, but we end it with shirk. Billah. We lose everything. It's how we end our life. So we need to be careful. And for those who have lived all their life away from Allah, they should never lose hope. Till the last minute, Allah can forgive them and grant them paradise. Isn't that beautiful? So we tell the believers, like you and me, be careful being in a class like this regularly. You still have to beg Allah for husnul khatima, the best end. And we tell those sinners and kafir, come, don't worry, say shahada, and Allah will grant you paradise. Okay. One final question, Sheikh, is that ah. at our death, we would know where our end where where we're going to land in right so huh? there were th three there were three groups you said um the mukmins the sinners and then the middle one uh are the sin and the kuffars right kufar, yeah. so the sinners may be believers that have got more sin than they do um good deeds so True. at death at death when you know you read about how how the angels come and if you're the mukmin, you're shrouded in really nice clothes and smell good and blah, blah, blah. And the kufar, we know what happens to them. So the, for the sinners, because they are believers, they will, inshallah, eventually be taken out from hell and go into paradise. What do they, how are they greeted upon their death by the angels of death? Another subject. Very good. Okay. Another subject, uh, uh, life and death. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, that's another book. There is a whole book about Sakarat al Maut from the moment we start fainting until we die, including okay. the grave. That's another right. subject. I will answer it because it will take us two, three hours. All just right. to be, just not to let shaitan create doubt in us. The sinners, till the last minute, Allah is ready to forgive them if they repent, and the non Muslims, if they embrace Islam. How about that? That's what I would focus, not, oh, this man lived all his life sinning. I may, mm -hmm. I may live all my life sinning, but I ended it with shahada and one good deed or two, end up in paradise. And na'udhu billah, I may live all my life as a good Muslim, 
the last day or two of my life, I do something very bad. <laughs> the, hadith, the hadith is very clear yeah. about it. This is why we should be careful with the Muslims and the non-Muslims should be hopeful. We give the hope to them until the last minute, including sinners. And we, we cannot think, oh, I made it. I say, I ask Allah to accept from me whatever I have done. So we live between fear and hope. Fear and hope, fear and hope. So we keep a balance. Okay. Okay. Another brother or sister, you're welcome. Thank yes, you. who are sister Nina? Go ahead. Yeah, Sheikh, having hear what you say uh, with what um, uh, Ka Azlia has uh, put forward, actually, we, we, we are very lucky, alhamdulillah, that we are Muslim, but we also have a responsibility to try and make those non Muslim or those Muslim who are not following Islam to. Mm. to follow the right path is is that is that what i can get from what we yes. discussed our part of thanking allah for us to make us born muslims or embrace islam at very early age of our lives is to make others become muslims do dawah invite them the best we can so if we see so if we see any non muslim who are being raised as a kufar it is part of our responsibility as well to make them aware that you, you are in the wrong path, come and join yes. and do it Yes, life. yes. And alhamdulillah, wallahi al-azim, by experience. By experience, I don't have to tell you what I did, alhamdulillah, in the US and other places. By talking almost every day and by letting them see my actions on a daily basis, especially when I was in jail. People start coming. Who are you? Why you pray? Why you sit there? I just share with them my coffee. Nice coffee. I give them. They start liking it. Why you read books? What? Why you pray too much? I want to be like you. What is Islam? Slowly. Alhamdulillah, tens became Muslims. Ten became Muslims. Tens. I don't want to say the right number unless you ask me on a private. Just one man in jail. Jail uh, immigration, huh? I didn't commit any crime. Huh. In America, enough crime, uh, you have, uh, you're a Muslim imam. Anyways, is this clear? So it's your duty to tell people about Islam through your actions first. They have to see you. Do you think you sisters who are wearing hijab in London, you are great ambassadors of Islam. Watch your behavior now. Because what people watch you more. When you are wearing hijab, they see if you pay or not. Certain items, they're watching you. Yes, they may even test you. Like this imam who was about to, sold, to sell Islam for a few pounds in Britain. A new imam came to Britain to, to be the imam of the community. So. He boarded the bus to go to the masjid. The, the driver, you know, in, in England, the driver can be your, uh, mashallah, they're so smart. They don't have a controller and a driver. The driver himself controls the finance to cut uh, their expenses. He paid deliberately that driver gave extra money to the imam to see. When the imam went to sit, he looked at his money. He found that, oh, there is extra money than he should have. So he was debating, should I give this kuffar? They are kuffar. They robbed us for years. Huh? British Empire, Queen Victoria, Queen Elizabeth, Queen I don't know who. So he was debating. When he's, uh, what you call it, station where he's supposed to drop off, came, he went to the driver and he said, sir, you have given me more than you should. You know what the driver told him? He said, sir, I was testing what type of Muslim you are. When that imam went off the bus, he felt his knees shivering. 
He said, I was about to sell Islam for a few pounds. The man was watching me, testing me. So there are people who are testing us. We need to do it for Allah's sake. We don't cheat anyone. We don't lie. We don't. And then that's Islam, mu'amalat. Then they see our ibadat. They're watching. Wallahi al-Azim, we become magnet. They will come to Islam. They will come to Islam. They're watching us. And remember, sisters and brothers who are living in the West, you represent Islam. If you do good, they say Ahmed and Nina and Asliya did good. If you do bad, they say Islam is bad. You see how unfair the Westerners? If I do something bad, say Zubair is bad, not Islam is bad. If I do something good, say Islam is good. They don't say it. They say that man is good. I was at a bus once, Sheh, and there were these um, kids coming back from school. This, I think they're Somalians or whatever. Um, they're all, of course, wearing hijab because it's, you know, um, they were shouting and screaming and cursing and all that. I went up to them and I told them off. I said, you're wearing, you're representing Islam. You're wearing a Muslim outfit here. Can you just kind of, you know. Very good. Oh, I got told off by them. They were so... Um, so uh, foul mouth. Um, to you, to you as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I tried to tell them off, um, you know. But it is, it is, it's quite, um, it's quite sad when that happens. Uh, I know because we don't focus on adab manners. Yes, indeed. Because we don't focus in our tarbiya, we don't teach our children the first thing: adab manners. We need to teach adab first. Once our children have the adab, that's it. They can learn other things. They can learn the Quran, they can learn the Hadith. But we focus on memorization, on parroting, parrot. This is the, this is the problem. Although Rasulullah didn't teach the children Quran from young, he taught them adab, manners. And then once they have the manners, he teach them the Quran. So we are not following the Prophet ﷺ in tarbiyah and adab. And, and non-Muslims love to see that. You say, see, look at them. I know, it's a bad representation. Yeah, 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 it's true. I know, I know. May Allah have mercy on us. Okay, okay, okay my brothers and sisters. One more question and we, we end. All right. Allahumma gfir lana, Allahumma rahamna, Allahumma tajawaz a sayyatina. Ya Allah, in this night of Jumu'ah, may you forgive all my sisters and brothers, all of them without exception in this class, their loved ones, their families. Ya Rab, we have brothers and sisters who are sick. Grant them shifa, ya Allah. Ya Allah, we have brothers and sisters who are traveling. May you be with them while they are in their journeys. Reach make them reach their destination safe and sound and be with them and guide them and send your malaika to protect them wherever they are. Ya Allah, we have ulama incarcerated in jail. May you release them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Let them go to their, their, their loved ones and families. Ya Rab, we have brothers, sisters who are occupied like Palestine. May, we, may you be with them, Kashmir, Rohingya. Ya Rab, return them, strengthen them and return them back to their countries. With dignity and honor. Amen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Alhamdulillah rabbil amin. Assalamu alaikum. Good night everyone. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you, Sheikh.